Our text is Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 11 that was read in our hearing this morning. A few weeks ago, we started a series of lessons where we began with the kingdom of heaven. We pointed out that when Jesus came to this earth, he came with the primary purpose of establishing his kingdom. The kingdom would be the means by which he would seek and save the lost. Once he established that kingdom, then Jesus also made it very clear during his ministry, as well as his apostles, that they needed, men needed to enter into that kingdom. Because when men enter into that kingdom, they are part of the saved. That kingdom is also referred to in the Bible as the body of Christ. Men need to enter into that body of Christ because it's only the body of Christ that shall find salvation. There won't be any salvation outside of the church or the body or the kingdom of Christ. Men need to enter into that kingdom. So that was the emphasis of that lesson. But then we began to develop a series of lessons about how to enter into that kingdom. And first of all, it takes faith. And that faith comes by the hearing of the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. That faith comes as a result of the obedience to the faith, the system of truth. And we emphasize that men must believe in order to be saved. There cannot be any salvation without belief. But we emphasize also that belief is not the only means or the only requirement for salvation. For the Bible also requires, we saw in other lessons, on repentance. That men need to turn away from their sinful way of life. Men have to make a conscientious decision no longer to serve Satan. They need to make a turnabout, for that's the very meaning of the term repentance, to turn about, to turn around. And then we emphasized last week how that men ought to confess with their mouths that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That too, like faith and repentance, are re prerequisites for entering into the kingdom. Man must confess his allegiance unto Christ. And we went through and what explained exactly what it meant to, for to stand up before an audience four uh, uh, witnesses, and say that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That implies much. It means that we're going to submit ourselves to the authority of Christ. And not only that, that we're going to be allegiant unto Him in all of our days. But even then, confession is made unto salvation. Salvation is not yet attained, even though one may have faith. Even though one may have repented of their sins. And even though one may have confessed the name of Jesus Christ, there's something else that must be done. Thus, when we turn our attention to the book of Romans in chapter 6, we will learn that the theme of this chapter is free from sin. Just because one has faith does not take away one's sin. Just because one repents of sin does not mean that the sin is still not marring his soul. When one confesses the name of Christ, that does not mean that sin has been remitted. There has to be some means that the Bible teaches by which that sin must be remitted and forgiven. That God remembers it no more. In Romans chapter 6, Paul talks about how that we can be freed from that sin. And the means by which that is accomplished is called baptism. The subject of water baptism is one of the most controversial topics in the religious world today and has been for many centuries. Beliefs differ as to the mode of baptism. Some want to believe that baptism is nothing more than sprinkling. Some want to say that baptism is nothing more than pouring. Some will contend that baptism indeed is immersion. And then some people will say that there's no need for that kind of thing at all called baptism. And thus they see that the world has argued for years about the mode of baptism. But not only that, beliefs differ as regard to the timing of baptism. Some believe that baptism uh, is for infants, that infants need to be baptized. While others believe that one must be of accountable age, for they must understand what they are doing. That they must be believers in order to be baptized. Beliefs differ as to the essentiality of baptism. Some believe that baptism is only a sign that one has already been saved. 
while others will contend that baptism is for the remission of sins and for salvation. Now there are other contrasts perhaps that we could make where people differ as to the subject of water baptism. But here's something I want to make very clear. People are not the authority in matters of salvation. God is. And God has spoken in his word as to what is the importance of baptism. And that's what we're going to study this morning. The important questions for our study are twofold. What does the Bible teach about baptism? And second, does the, what the Bible teach about baptism, do I agree with it? And will I, am I willing to comply with it? Whatever that teaching is. Before I get into an actual studying about baptism, I was reading the other day about one of our great scholars or thinkers of times past by the name of Frank, uh, Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon lived in the 1600s, but he was a very wise individual and had written some materials on impediments to correct thinking. And while I was reading some of the things that he was talking about, impediments to thinking, I want you to think about these impediments in regard to what the Bible teaches about baptism. First of all, he said one of the first impediments to right thinking is wishful thinking. You know, when children are small, they think that they one day are going to grow up and they boys may want to be a cowboy. And girls may grow up and they may want to be perhaps a nurse. But at that point in their life, that is nothing more than wishful thinking. Many people today are involved in wishful thinking to thinking that because God is an all-loving God, that he couldn't possibly condemn somebody to hell. But they fail to realize that God is not only an all loving God, he's an all just God as well. And therefore, wishful thinking isn't going to make things go away that we don't want to do. Another thing is I see impediment to right thinking, says Francis Bacon, is personal prejudices. Personal prejudices warps people's abilities to reason correctly and objectively. These prejudices cause emotional reactions rather than object, uh, uh, objective ones. For instance, let me illustrate it this way. There are a lot of people that realize that their parents lived under a different system or set of beliefs than what the Bible actually says. And therefore, because of their preferences toward their parents, will reject what the Bible actually says. Just because your parents held to a certain belief does not make it the truth. If you want to know what absolute truth is, listen to Jesus. When he said, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth, John 17, 17. So we need to understand that personality, uh, or personal preferences or prejudices has never determined what truth is or what isn't. We need to go to God's Word. Another impediment to correct thinking is the failure to define terms. Sometimes languages causes us to misunderstand one another. But when it comes to the Bible, and the Bible being written in what is known as the Koine language, all of those words have definite meanings and do not change with time because Koine language Koine Greek language is a dead language. Whatever it meant in the first century is what it means in this century. And therefore, when somebody comes to the word baptism, we cannot allow them to redefine the term as it is used in the New Testament. It has a definite meaning. So let's make sure that we define our terms correctly, because if we do not, it's an impediment to correct thinking. I've never dealt with a false teacher yet that did not want to redefine terms we cannot allow that to happen. We have to stick with the good book. A fourth impediment Francis Bacon brings to our attention is a blind acceptance of tradition as authority. Traditions may interfere with our ability to reason properly. In fact, such was the case with the Pharisees that Jesus brought out very clearly in Matthew chapter 23, where the Pharisees were so steeped in their tradition 
that they broke the very law which they profess to be under. Therefore, we need to make sure that we're people that do not allow tradition to determine what is right and wrong. God's word still. I don't care how old the Bible is. Well, we say it's over 2,000 years old. That's fine. But that Bible hasn't changed in its meaning. That Bible still says the same. And it still refutes the traditions of men that go contrary to it. Now with those things in mind and those impediments in mind, let's not allow them to temper or temper with the way we think. Now what the Bible teaches about baptism. Romans chapter 6 is a great chapter of the Bible. Sin is that which separates us from God. That chapter begins with Paul saying, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead live in sin any longer? Notice that the apostle then made it very clear that we're not to live continuously under sin. Let's remember that sin is that which separates us from God. Isaiah made that clear in chapter 59 and verse 2, didn't he? But your iniquities will separate between you and your God, and your sins will hit his face from you that he will not hear. When you violate the will of God, when you transgress the law of God, you're in sin. And therefore, as a Christian, once your sins have been remitted, you don't no longer want to continue in the practice of sin. That's what Paul's saying. And thus we can see that we need to realize that all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What we need is salvation from that sin. That's why the theme of chapter 6 is freedom from sin. Because Paul is going to remind the Roman brethren, and you and me as well, exactly how it is that we have found freedom from sin. Thus we go to this particular chapter to learn how important it is for the salvation of our souls. And one of the first things that we're going to see this morning, when we look at verse 3 and verse 4, where Paul says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The first thing I observe here is that Paul makes it very clear that baptism, as to its mode, is immersion. Baptism is immersion because by its very definition, it means to immerse, to dip, to plunge. It implies an overwhelming. All reputable scholars, in their lexical studies of the biblical word baptizo, have all determined that baptizo does not mean sprinkling, it does not mean pouring, it means an immersion in water. If the Lord had authorized sprinkling for baptism, or if he had authorized pouring for baptism, he would have used other words other than baptizo. The word for sprinkling is another word, which is rantizo. And if it's going to be pouring, it would have been cheo. But the point of it is that what we need to realize is this. These are not the words that the Lord used. The word he used was baptism or baptizo, which means to immerse one with the implication of emergence. You go under, you come up. So baptism is, by its very definition, immersion. Baptism is immersion because only in immersion are we buried and raised. The text says that we are buried with him by baptism into death, and then we're raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. It's only in the action of baptism that you can see this being portrayed. Baptism is the semblance, first of all, of Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, and which also ye received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I have received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now I want you to notice that in the gospel message, the central idea is that Christ 
died, was buried, and resurrected. But back in our text of Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, Paul said, Know ye not that so many of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism. And then he talks about how that we are raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. What is the picture we have here? The fact is that baptism is the semblance of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. When one is baptized, one is obeying the likeness of the facts of the gospel. The facts of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now you can't obey facts, but you can obey the likeness of them. And Paul tells us how. And that's in baptism. So when one is baptized, one is baptized, you bury a dead man who's dead in his sins. You bury him. And then when he rises out of that water, Paul says he walks in the newness of life. So there's resurrection. But baptism is not only immersion in that we are buried and raised, but it's an immersion an essential because it is being in the likeness of death and resurrection of Christ. Notice verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Notice the conditionality of the statement. For if, that's a statement of conditionality. If we have been planted or united with Christ in baptism, then there will, and if we haven't been, then there's not going to be any resurrection to a newness of life. In the likeness of Jesus' death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. If one has not been planted or united with Christ in baptism, there will be no glorious resurrection for you. That's important that we all be realize how important baptism is. Do you realize when people reject baptism, that they're rejecting the very mode, they're rejecting the very blessing of being involved in the very death and resurrection of Christ and the likeness thereof? If there is no resurrection of baptism, and there is though, if there is a resurrection of baptism, and of course there is, then there also must be a rising or coming up out of something. So there is a death and a resurrection. In the Bible baptism there is a resurrection from water. We know that. In fact, we could go to Acts chapter 8 and see where Philip baptized the eunuch. We'll see that in a minute, but where he went down into the water, and then they, he, they came up out of the water, indicating that baptism is immersion. But notice also, baptism is immersion because God planned it that way. No matter what men may think, or what men may say, baptism it was planned to be immersion in water, and that was God's plan from the beginning. Jesus taught, he that believeth and is baptized or is immersed shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. That's Peter concurred with that in Acts 2, 38. When he said, repent and be baptized or immersed for the remission of one's sins. It's beyond me that people can deny that baptism is, the, is that part that God planned to save man. That men need to be immersed in water, but men still continue to reject it. And we know it's for the remission of sins. But I get to thinking about Naaman in 2 Kings in chapter 5 of verses 1 through 14. Here was a man who was a leper. He was told by the prophet of God to go and dip himself or wash himself in the river Jordan seven times. Now what if Naaman had refused to do that? Well, he did at first, didn't he? Finally, he conceded. And he went and he dipped himself seven times in the waters of Jordan. <coughs> and when he did, he rose out of that um, water and he had ba a skin as of a baby. He had been healed. Joe, would you mind getting me a glass of water, please? <coughs> so the point I'm trying to make here is this. What if he had not obeyed the requirement of the prophet of God? and not dipped himself seven times in the river Jordan. He would have never been cleansed. The same thing is true when it comes to baptism as immersion, which God has required. If you're not going to be immersed in water, to rise out of that water to walk in the newness of life, you're not going to have forgiveness of sins. 
you're not going to be cleansed of your sins. <coughs> Let's go to the next one. Baptism is immersion because the rest of the Bible attests to that fact. When Jesus was baptized, he wasn't sprinkled or poured upon. As I recall years ago, there was a movie where they actually portrayed Jesus standing in the water with John the baptizer next to him. And John the baptizer sprinkled him, John the baptizer poured on him, and John the baptizer immersed him. I guess they're trying to satisfy all men rather than satisfying God. But as I thought about that, there's one thing I know. The Bible clearly teaches that John the baptizer baptized Jesus. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16, and when Jesus was baptized, he went straightway up out of the water. That doesn't describe sprinkling or pouring. Baptism is the, in the boat is immersion. When John the baptizer was going about the countryside baptizing, John the Apostle wrote about him in John 3 verse 23 that John was baptized in Enid near to Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. What difference would it make if there was much water there or not if sprinkling or pouring is the mode for baptism? No, John's baptism, which is similar to Christ's baptism, only looking forward to the coming of the Christ, which also was also for the remission of sins, Mark 1.4. But it was always, of course, looking forward to the shedding of the Christ's blood. The point of it is, is that that baptism of John was just like Christ's baptism in its mode. It was an immersion in water. Had to be much water. When Philip and the, and the eunuch were going on their way, it said they commanded the chariot to stand still. And Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized the eunuch. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip. Notice again, going into, coming up out of. Folks, why would anybody want to dispute that baptism in its mode is an immersion in water, an emergence out of it to walk in the newness of life? You say, well, why are you preaching to us? We all believe that. Well, I'm not preaching just to you. I'm reminding you, but I'm also preaching to people that may be watching this live streaming. I may be preaching this to people who will watch this when it's recorded and, and be on the internet forever. The point I'm trying to make is this. Do you realize how many countless people in this world do not believe that baptism is immersion? And how many practice sprinkling? And how many practice pouring? And how many don't practice baptism at all? Baptism is immersion. And the Bible is replete with information. Baptism is also another thing that our text tells us in verse 6 and 7. Notice it says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Not only is baptism then described by Paul as immersion, but he also describes it as remission. Remission the Greek word means a dismissal or a release. You say, well, the word remission is not found in those two verses you read. Hold on. The, verse, the word may not be found, but the implication is. You see, when one is baptized, they have the remission of their sins, according to Acts 2.38. One has been released or cleared of the penalty of sin. It is translated sometimes, the word remission, as forgiveness, like in Mark 3.29 or Ephesians 1.7 or Colossians 1.14. And I also was thinking about Naaman again. He was in remission when the, he obeyed the Lord. His sin or his leprosy was dismissed or released. Remission in the New Testament is not for the cleansing of the body. Peter made that clear in chapter 3, verse 21 of his first epistle. The like figure one to baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remission of sins is cleansing of the soul. Paul explains that once a person has been baptized and the body of sin has been destroyed in our text. The old man is crucified with him. 
the body of sin is destroyed, that henceforth we no longer serve sin. But I want you to note the next verse. For he that is dead is freed, freed from sin. To be freed from sin connotes release from sin, remission. Yes, remission is taught in those two verses, that baptism is for remission. We need a release from our sins. Remember, the very theme of the chapter is freedom from sin. It begins by being immersed in water for baptism. And now we see that, that when one has done that, there's a release of one's sins. You're freed from sin. Baptism is remission because the rest of the New Testament attests to the fact. Acts 2.38 still says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, the clearing of your sins, the dismissal of your sins. If you haven't been baptized, you still have sins marring your soul. But at the point of baptism, that's when your sins are dismissed, released. And it's what people oftentimes refer to as being the pivotal point between being in the world and being in Christ where salvation is. Baptism is. Now, faith, repentance, confession are all prerequisites to enter into the kingdom of heaven, but baptism is where the actual placing of one in Christ takes place. Whereas many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, Galatians 3.27. That's because your sins have now been remitted. Now you're allowed to enter into the saved. The saved are in the church. Look at Acts 2.47. Praising God and having favor with all the people the Lord had to the church. Daily such as were being saved. Jesus, Savior of his body. Ephesians 5.23. You better be in the body if you want to be saved. And the only way to do that is to be baptized. And that is because that's where you have to be your sins remitted. In order to do that. My last point. The last point Paul makes here about freedom from sin. Is that baptism is not only immersion. That's the mode. It's not only remission, that's the purpose for remission, but it's also for regeneration. Regeneration. Look at verses 8 through 11 again. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, now look at verse 11. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul teaches the Roman brethren, reminding them that after they became Christians, they were now alive unto God. Regeneration is a renewal. It's a rebirth. In fact, it is defined as bringing into existence again. Thus, when one is baptized, he is born again into Christ. And that's why he says, now if you be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Now, you were once dead in your sins. But you need to be reborn. You need to be regenerated. And the way that is done is when one is baptized. So if one dies with Christ in baptism, and when he rises out of that water, he lives with him. Did not Paul say that when one is baptized that we walk in a newness of life, that's regeneration. We've been regenerated, we've been reborn, necessitates the first that death to sin, and then a coming to life in Christ when once is baptized. And folks, the rest of the New Testament proves this fact. Notice Colossians 2 with me, verse 12 and verse 13. Buried with him in baptism, there's the mode, Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith and the operation of God, which has raised him from the dead. Now notice he's talked about Jesus, who has now been risen from the grave, risen from the dead. Then he says, and you, talking about the Colossian brethren, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, that word quickened means made alive. Hath he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses? You're regenerated. You're reborn. 
Now you're a different person than you used to be. Once you were dead in your sins, now you're alive unto God with your sins being remitted. How can anybody reject baptism? It's a condition for our salvation. Remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away, behold, all things become new. We walk in a newness of life, Romans 6, 4. Baptism is immersion. Baptism is remission. Baptism is regeneration. Only the mind that is prejudiced with denominational thinking is unable to see these truths. The Bible's clear. Don't allow anything to be an impediment to your correct thinking. Just because you want to wish that you don't have to be baptized or be saved doesn't make it so. Just because mom and daddy never obeyed the gospel doesn't mean that you should not. Just because you have blind acceptance of man-made traditions, well, that's the way it's always been in my church. I don't care what's been in your church. I want to know what the Bible says. Don't you allow these impediments to thinking, to correct thinking, keep you from being baptized for the remission of your sins. You need to become a Christian. And once you have done that, you're going to enter into Christ and into his kingdom where the saved are numbered. We've come a long way in our sermons the last few weeks talking about the plan of salvation. But I want all of us to understand the kingdom, Jesus came to place his people, the saved, in it. Are you in it? You are if you believe in Christ and you've been willing to repent and turn from your sin, to confess the precious name of Christ before witnesses. I'm be baptized to have your past sins washed away and you're walking now in the newness of life in Christ, in his kingdom, in the church. And if you have failed to do that, now's a good time to make yourself become a Christian, to become a Christian. If you're a nurturing child of God and need to repent, we'll be glad to pray with you this morning. If there are any who are subject to heaven's invitation, won't you come now together as we stand and as we sing.